Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, looks like we have some attendance uh, all the way from the East Coast to West Coast here today, and also people joining us from Houston, Texas. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today's session at uh, the Sierra Wall Gas Academy. I'm Jeff Erickson, Vice President of Customer Service and Sales at Sierra Wall. Uh, today, I'd like, I would like to welcome you to a complimentary session with our, our partner, uh, Brown Technologies. Today is to help us learn about the API 6B standard, the different types of valves and their associated features. You will also learn about the common best practices related to valve handling, storage, maintenance, and more. <coughs> Excuse me. Your presenter today is Ben Marchisio, President, Managing Director of Brone Inc. Ben will give you a little bit more about himself when he begins his presentation. <coughs> we will be taking questions throughout the presentation, so please use your chat or Q&A feature in the Zoom to submit your questions. Can you take it away, Ben? Thank you, Jeff, um, and welcome everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for uh, this session. Um, in this session, uh, we will uh, present some key features of the API 6D specification, and we will share with you some of uh, uh, the best practices that we uh, experienced uh, while manufacturing ball valves for natural gas service. As uh, Jeff said, let's start with a brief introduction of myself. So this is me uh, with my family. For those who don't identify me, this is me. The other ones are my kids and my wife. I'm the president of Brown Inc. Uh, I was born and raised in Milan, Italy. So this is where my accent is coming from. And forgive me for my uh, broken English. I hope you can understand me. And in 2012, I moved to Houston, Texas, where I'm uh, currently based. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by background. I have an extensive valve experience with Brown and also with other international valve manufacturers. And my focus has always been uh, natural gas pipelines, mainly in North America, the US and Canada. I'm the father of seven for now, as far as I know. And uh, pre-COVID I was loving sports and traveling and I'm looking forward to going back to this old habits. A quick introduction to our webinar. We'll cover mainly three uh, topics. First, API 6D, uh, what the different types of valves are included in API 6D, and uh, some of the definitions, including double block and bleed and double isolation and bleed that sometimes are confusing to uh, people dealing with valves. Second section will be about uh, uh, what we consider some of the uh, best practices when handling valves from specification to uh, use of valves. Uh, they are based on common sense and uh, our experience. Uh, there is no rocket science behind that uh, and we will be very practical more than uh, technical, but I hope you will find that interesting. Finally, uh, we will have uh, some preliminary considerations of where we see the um, natural gas industry going and what that the impact would be on valves. And then brief conclusions and takeaways. So uh, let's start with the first section and let's start with the first poll where we ask you about your experience uh, with valves. So um, CR Wall will uh, show you the poll and uh, we will ask you a brief question to, to answer, to understand what your experience is with, uh, with valves. Okay, so we have the uh, results. I see that nobody is uh, uh, brave enough to declare himself a valve guru. 
which is good because otherwise I would be learning from him more than uh, teaching. It seems that we have the, the right audience. So people who know about VALS, but they are open to learning more, which is great. I actually would define myself in this category. And then uh, there are some people who don't know that much. And thanks God, there is nobody who is not interested in VALS because in that case, they would be in the wrong webinar. So thank you for participating to the poll. That gives us a sense of uh, the audience we have. Uh, for me, it's an unusual uh, way of presenting. Uh, I like when I'm in person in front of people and I don't see the audience today. I know we have a, a large group from different gas companies in Canada, from uh, east to west, which is great. And I hope to have a chance to uh, to see you in person soon. So let's start with the definition, what the API 6D standard is. It is a valve specification um, for petroleum and natural gas. Uh, we currently are using the 24th edition, which was released in 2014, and it was made effective a year after in 2015. It's important to note that uh, uh, the API 6D committee is working on the 25th edition. It was supposed to be released uh, uh, last year. And then with the COVID craziness, everything was postponed, including the release of this specification. Um, but we are looking forward to seeing it. Uh, I have seen some drafts uh, for comments. Uh, there will be some changes, but we don't expect any major uh, change. Currently, the sections uh, that are included are valve types and configurations. And the API 6D includes four types of uh, block valves. Ball valves, gate valves, plug valves, and check valves. Um, check valves are slightly different than the other types because they are used for um, as a, a backflow preventers. The other valves are pure on-off valves where uh, the operator decides for uh, opening or closing them. The API 60 uh, standards, uh, standard includes uh, some design uh, recommendation, uh, including uh, some guidance on the uh, design code uh, used to size the valve, uh, pressure rating, um, materials, welding specifications, uh, the recommendation to use approved uh, um, welding procedures, and the recommendation to have the welders certified. Quality control, how to perform and how to report NDEs. Pressure testing for the shell test, uh, seat test, and uh, uh, supplemental tests. Coating painting, uh, marking, how to present the, an API 6D uh, compliant label. How to prepare the valves for shipments how to uh, prepare the documentation and archive it and submit it to customers, and then what the requirements for the facility uh, are. It is important to note that evolved to be API 6D, uh, it has to carry a monogram, and the monogram is given to the factory that manufactured the valves. Uh, the API monogram identifies the uh, best organizations that manufacture valves that prove the, their ability to uh, comply with the valve specification. One of the requirements is to have a quality management system compliant with the API uh, Q1, and uh, the API 6D monogram has to be maintained. So periodically, uh, API uh, auditors have to perform audits to the factory um, to confirm the validity of the monogram. And Braun uh, is proud of having uh, the API 6D monogram, 6D0378, for several decades. And again, this is a sign of, uh, for sure, compliance, but also the uh, high level of quality of our products. Some definitions. Um, let me. So we are speaking of block valves. Uh, the, the purpose of uh, block valves is to block the flow into the downstream direction when the valve is in closed position. 
It is important to note, and we will see this again uh, during the presentation, that block valves are to be used for on-off service only, not for regulating the flow and not in partially open position. Again, on some definitions of the uh, key valve components, uh, the body. The body is the pressure containing, the main pressure containing component to prevent external leaks. And uh, uh, it can be in different uh, materials, different configurations, and we will see some details uh, later. The key component is called the obturator, which is the part, the moving part of the valve that permits or prevents flow through the valve. And it is the part that defines the valve type. So in our presentation, the obturator can be a ball, a gate, or a plug. The seat is the surface upon which the obturator rests to prevent the flow through the valve. And it can be uh, a metal metallic material or a soft uh, a polymer or a thermoplastic material. And it can be fixed or spring-loaded. And then uh, the stem, which is the part connected uh, with the obturator that allows for opening and closing operation. So here on this page, uh, we are comparing the three uh, types of on-off valves that are included in API 6D, ball valve, gate valve, and plug valve. And we will highlight some features, um, keeping in mind that there are always a lot of exceptions, details that are either not uh, included in uh, API 6D or they are allowed by API 6D. So first, let's start with the service. The ball valve is the typical valve used for natural gas service. Again, there are plenty of exceptions. There are uh, ball valves for severe service, for slurry in mining applications, but that is not the typical ball application. There are some uh, users that prefer ball valves also for liquid service, but again, that is not typical. When it gets to liquids, the most common type of valve is the gate valve. And then there are plug valves that are used both for gas and liquid service. There are a lot of different configurations and options. And here I will list some, again, um, to keep this presentation uh, simple. I didn't try to be comprehensive, but it gives you again some indications of the different types of valves. So ball valves uh, can have a forged or a cast body. They can be floating type or trunnion mounted. They can be full port or reduced port. The, the body can be bolted or welded. They can be top entry or side entry and uh, the seats can be self relieving uh, or double piston effect. And we will see some more details about the different seat uh, configurations uh, later on. Gate valves can be wedge gate or slab gate or expanding gate. And the expanding gates can be double or single expanding type. The body can be plate fabricated or cast. The valve can be uh, with a rising stem or an internal screw. They can be standard acting or reverse acting, and the seats can be fixed seats or Springer energized seats. Uh, the plug valves can be lubricated or non lubricated or standard type or expanding type. The, the valve uh, reacts in a different way uh, depending on the pressure in the upstream uh, uh, pipe. So in a floating ball valve, uh, the higher the pressure, the better the sealing performance. So the fluid pressure assists the sealing effect. In trunnion valves, there is limited effect of the fluid pressure on the sealing performance. And actually, you prefer to have with higher pressure a trunnion mounted valve, otherwise the pressure will increase so much the torque that will, uh, it will make the valve hard to operate or easy to break. Uh, with the moving to the gate valve type, slab gates, um, typically the fluid pressure helps in sealing. With the expanding type, uh, there is no effect of uh, uh, the fluid pressure on the ceiling performance. The standard plug valve is pressure energized and uh, the expanding plug uh, is very similar to the expanding gate. So uh, there is a tight mechanical seal in any pressure condition. In terms of operator and automation, um, 
Ball valves are quarter turn valves, so they require a quarter turn actuator. Gate valves are linear valves, and uh, usually the actuator for these uh, um, valves is much bigger, and it's a multi turn actuator. Plug valves are a quarter turn valve as uh, the ball valves. In terms of uh, weight and size, uh, ball valves are quite compact. Um, gate valves are very tall. So there is also an impact in terms of space and uh, uh, valve and pipe support. And plug valves are more compact. And then I introduce some attention points to keep in mind when you specify a valve. Um, in the ball valve, in the standard ball valve, there is friction between the seats and the closing element, which is the ball. So if you have hard particles in the flow, they can scratch uh, the ball and the seat. Uh, in some cases, compromising the performance of the valve. In uh, the gate valve, the most critical uh, aspect is the stem packing uh, that is um, subject to high stress because of the linear movement of the uh, stem. So many times uh, uh, the stem packing has to be maintained or replaced. Uh, gate valves are not that much affected by uh, dirt or sand or uh, hard particles in the flow. Plug valves are usually um, with a reduced port, uh, so there is usually a significant pressure drop and they are not piggable. And then uh, for the lubricated type, lubrication is very important to ensure performance. I know there is a lot of uh, uh, information condensed in this uh, page and it can be confusing. And again, it's not comprehensive, but I think and I hope this gives you a, a good overview of the different uh, valve types. Now I have some pictures to show you uh, what I explained, explained in uh, words. On this uh, page on the left hand side, you see some uh, floating ball valves um, with welded body in the center. You see a trunnion mounted ball valve with a welded body made of forged, uh, forged components. And uh, on the right hand side, you see another trunnion mounted uh, uh, ball valve, this time uh, with a bolted body. You see all the uh, bolts uh, near the, the, um, the flange and the closure. Moving to the gate valves, on the uh, left side, you see a slab gate valve with the plate fabricated body. Uh, on the right hand side, an expanding gate valve with the cast body. And just comparing these pictures to the previous pictures, you see how tall and uh, big these valves are. So usually you need a, a platform to operate the valve because it's, it can be hard to reach. And then plug valves on the left hand side, the typical uh, standard lubricated plug, va plug valve made with a cast body. And on the um, right hand side, a much heavier expanding plug valve, again with a cast body. Let's uh, uh, now move to some other key features in the API 60 valves. Uh, single piston effect seats and double piston effect seats, and then double block and bleed and double isolation and bleed. And to explain these features, uh, I have a couple of uh, short videos, so I will uh, launch them. I hope uh, the audio is, not, is okay. Pro and Balamax API 6D monogrammed valves come with two seat options, single piston effect and double piston effect. The single piston effect seat releases any overpressure in the body cavity to the site of the lower pressure. This mechanism prevents excessive pressure within the body cavity. Let's take a closer look at what happens in the seat area. 
When the pressure in the body cavity goes beyond the design level, the force generated will exceed the force of the spring and will allow for the gas trap to be released. The single piston effect seat is also known as self-relieving seat or unidirectional seat. Let's now focus on the other seat option available for the Balamax API 6D ball valves, the double piston effect seat. In valves featuring the double piston effect seat, any pressure is contained within the body cavity. An external relief device is recommended to avoid excessive pressure within the body cavity. Looking at the seat dynamics, we can notice that as the pressure within the body cavity increases, so also does the pressure of the seat on the ball, therefore containing the gas and preventing any release. The double piston effect seat is also known as bi-directional seat. Rowan is based in Houston, Texas, to conveniently support their customers in North America. Please contact Broin for any valve need you may have. The double block and bleed feature of the valve is the ability to segregate two pressure sources and to bleed or vent pressure in the void between two sealing elements. All Broin Balamax valves provide the double block and bleed feature. The double isolation and bleed feature is the ability to provide two sealing elements to a single pressure source and to bleed or vent between the two sealing elements. In the valve industry, there are two types of double isolation and bleed features. The first type is called DIB1. Trunnion mounted ball valves providing the DIB1 feature have two bidirectional seats. The Balamax valves with two seats, with double piston effect, are DIB1. The second type of double isolation and bleed feature is called DIB2. In this case, the seat on the side of the pressure source is unidirectional, and the downstream seat, on the side of the open ender equipment, must be bidirectional. It is important to pay attention of the direction when it is installed. Please note that the valve with two single piston effect seats does not provide the double isolation and bleed feature. Broin is based in Houston, Texas, to conveniently support their customers in North America. Please contact Broin for any valve need you may have. I hope uh, the, the videos helped in clarifying uh, the definitions of the seat options and the double block and bleed and double isolation and bleed features. I know those definitions can uh, sound confusing and maybe you will want to take a second look at these videos. They will be made available as part of this presentation on uh, the CR wall uh, YouTube uh, channel. So with the videos, we concluded the first section about the API 6D standard. And again, I know uh, we didn't go deep into all the details uh, of the standard. Um, my recommendation is to keep the, the API 6D uh, document handy when you work on valves. Uh, there is no need of uh, memorizing it, uh, but uh, every now and then uh, you may have 
questions or doubts and uh, you find a lot of answers in, uh, in the document itself. Jeff, if you have any questions uh, about API 6D from our audience, uh, this is a good time. Otherwise, we can uh, move to the second section. Uh, ben, no, no questions yet. Just a reminder, if you do have questions, use the question and answer chat at the bottom of uh, the um, screen. Yeah, and uh, we will have time also at the end for, uh, for questions, uh, if people need more time to, to prepare it. But uh, at the end of any section, I will uh, give you the option to, uh, to ask your questions. So let's move again um, to the second section about valve best practices. Um, these are our own uh, practices, mainly focusing on the interactions with our customers. So they are not uh, uh, best practices on uh, designing or manufacturing uh, valves, but more focusing on uh, how we communicate uh, with our customers and uh, what type of feedbacks uh, we get from them and what type of problems they have with uh, with box. So I identified uh, nine uh, categories. The first one is about uh, the system design and valve specification. So uh, many times we see that uh, uh, problems with valves are originated by the use of the wrong valve. Uh, the strong recommendation, which sounds uh, very simple, uh, but it, it is not obvious, is to use the right valve for the service. Um, Keeping in mind uh, that many times uh, pipelines are designed for clean and dry gas, but you may have some surprises. So uh, from a system perspective, we recommend uh, the system engineers, uh, process engineers, uh, equipment uh, uh, engineers to include in the pipeline the appropriate filtration and treatment system to keep the gas uh, as clean and as dry as possible. But at the same time, um, our valves are equipped with a, as a standard with the PMSS seat, primary metal, secondary soft, which is a little more forgiving than a standard uh, soft seated ball valve. What does that mean? Basically, the first point of contact between the ball and the seat is uh, uh, the metal seating. That metal seating has two main features. One, it protects the soft seat. So if you have uh, some hard particles, they force to hit the metal component and, uh, and not the HNBR uh, soft seat that can be easily uh, damaged. And second, they ensure um, fire safety. The soft seat is the one that ensures uh, zero leakage. And uh, in our standard API 6D valves, it is in uh, HNBR. And in general, um, in the, we see a lot of uh, doubts or concerns uh, uh, when the valve specification is not clear. For us, the basic set of information to make sure that we are supplying the, um, the right valve is listed uh, in this page. So we need to know the valve type. Is it a ball valve that you need or a gate valve? What type of uh, size? What pressure class? What type of end connections? It's important for us to know uh, the service conditions, uh, fluid, temperature, uh, to verify that all the materials are the right ones. Uh, we need to know which standard to comply to, for example, API 6D. We need to know if you have any specific test requirements. If you tell us that uh, you need an API 6D monogram valve, we will for sure deliver a valve that is tested for API 6D. But there are some customers that uh, require an extended uh, uh, pressure test or a, a specific fire test or a specific fugitive emission test. So let us know if you have any specific test requirement. Same with the paint and coating. And finally, the type of operator. Uh, we can supply valves that are lever operated, uh, operated with a two inch nut, uh, with a gear, with an actuator and any type of actuator. But of course we need to know. So if you have a valve specification, please share it. We will uh, always review it and comment it. Hopefully, most of the times we will comply with every requirement. Sometimes we will ask for uh, uh, deviations or exceptions, but it's very important 
to know what valve you need. The second uh, group of uh, best practices is about uh, valve maintenance. So FEMSA uh, specified the requirements in the Federal Code 49, Section 192, and uh, um, it is applicable mainly to uh, US uh, systems, but sometimes also Canadian uh, um, uh, gas companies uh, apply those requirements. So the requirements for transmission lines is that every valve has to be inspected uh, and partially operated at intervals not exceeding 15 months, but at least uh, once each calendar year. And for distribution systems, uh, each valve must be checked and serviced at intervals not exceeding 15 months, but at least once each calendar year. What we recommend at uh, Braun is that our floating ball valves, uh, we consider them maintenance free. So we recommend that to operate the valve at least once each calendar year to verify that the ball is not stuck. Uh, but again, those valves are maintenance free. For our Braun API 6D, each one of them is equipped with uh, injection ports and with a bleed system. So our recommendation is to flush the seats, to, to clean them, lubricate the seat uh, to reduce the torque and operate the valve at least uh, once a year. And uh, we recommend to use uh, the flush lubricant and sealant products recommended by us or by the valve manufacturer uh, you use or the lubricant manufacturer. And uh, Broin recommends seal weld products. Uh, those products are distributed into Canada by CR Wall. And I know we have a couple of friends from Sealed World on, um, on this webinar. So maybe at the end, they may be adding some additional information about their products if they want. Here you see uh, how our lubrication uh, systems are designed. So we have ports on the, the seats, as you see on the left. Um, the injection ports are always equipped uh, with uh, uh, giant button head uh, grease fittings and for the larger valves also with an inner check valve. And we also have uh, lubrication ports on the stem. Moving to the next best, pra best practice, um, a lot of uh, problems are caused uh, during transport transportation, handling and storage. So um, we recommend that the valve supplier, the manufacturer or the distributor you use to properly pack the valves to ensure safety and valve protection. We recommend that the valves are transported in their original shipping packaging uh, and they are properly secured to the vehicle. Um, the manufacturer should always uh, supply written procedures. And in the, on the right hand side of this slide, you see a snapshot of our um, procedures that you find in our technical manual. And all our valves are equipped uh, with uh, end caps and flange covers to protect uh, uh, the end connections and with the plastic wrapping to protect the valves from uh, uh, contamination. Valve coating. Uh, valve coating for a body service is a complex uh, process. And uh, you want to make sure that the, the coating is applied in compliance with the uh, coating specification. So um, make sure that your suppliers use the, the right coating system uh, that is uh, uh, the right fit for your service. And uh, we recommend to ask for a coating data sheet for your review. And then the coating has to be applied correctly. So uh, here you see some pictures of how we apply our um, epoxy coating at Broen. We use a pluricomponent airless uh, spray equipment uh, system, which is uh, the one on the left hand side. And that uh, uh, ensures that the mixing ratio between the two components that make uh, our epoxy coating have the right uh, mixing ratio and the right temperature. And we use uh, a, 
a gun that is in compliance with the manufacturer's uh, specification to ensure the right coating thickness. If uh, the coating is not applied uh, properly, uh, some of the, the problems you can experience are corrosion, uh, first of all, but also you can have uh, a blistering of the coating, this bonding, especially if the coating is uh, applied uh, using a thinner or in uh, multiple layers. Uh, epoxy coatings are supposed to be applied in one coat and to reach the right uh, thickness in just one coat. And uh, based on our experience, this is probably the most common uh, uh, cause of problems with the uh, valves is when the valves are welded on site. Uh, the problems can be caused by overheating uh, the seats. And uh, to avoid that, uh, there are two ways. One, to follow the manufacturer's uh, recommendation. Um, and again, they are available in our technical manuals. Another way to reduce the risk of overheating uh, your seats is to use um, protective products like seal weld, weld shield, which is a paste that you apply over uh, the seats prior to welding, and it will work as a insulation and screen to protect your, uh, your seats. The other um, cause of problems when uh, welding is to leave weld slugs in the line uh, as you can see in the picture in the bottom on the right hand side of the, the slide. Our uh, strong recommendation is whenever you weld the valve to do it with the valve in open position, use the proper welding procedure and uh, carefully follow the manufacturer's recommendation. Valve commissioning is another critical point. Uh, a valve uh, requires to be uh, to work on a clean pipeline. So before operating the valve, make sure that you clean uh, the pipeline, removing any external particles, welding slugs, sand. Uh, uh, building a pipeline is uh, is not a clean process. So a lot of things happen, and um, the valve has to be installed in open position and before operating it's make sure that the valve uh, is clean. Again, our primary metal uh, secondary soft seats help uh, preventing damages by external particles, but uh, keep in mind that valves are delicate uh, pieces of equipment. And then if you hydro test your line, uh, dry the valve after test uh, um, using nitrogen, hot air or vacuum and avoid the methanol because it can be aggressive on the soft goods. Over torquing, um, all our valves have mechanical stops and both valves are set on position. They are not set on torque. So if you apply an extra torque, you are not uh, improving the ceiling performance. Many times you just risk to damage the valve. In our valve design, we make sure that the uh, weakest point is never a critical component. So if you break it, you don't compromise the ceiling performance of the valve and uh, um, the, the broken part can be repaired or replaced uh, with the valve in service, again, because the valve is supposed to seal. But at the same time, uh, um, be careful, avoid uh, over torquing uh, your valves. Throttling uh, our valves, the, the API 60 valves, as we said, uh, are supposed to be used for on off service. So they have to be either open or closed. They are not designed to stay in partially open position. The right hand side, uh, the picture on the right hand side of this slide shows a, a ball that was uh, kept in partially open position and it was damaged by um, cavitation. Whenever you restrict the, the flow, you cause high velocity in the fluid and you may also cause cavitation. So, uh, of course, when you transition from open to close and vice versa, the valve has to be in partially open position, but cannot stay in that position. Finally, pigging. Uh, pigging 
can be a cause of, uh, of problems on valves. Of course, you want to have uh, a full port piggable valve when you pig a line, and then the valve must be in open position. And uh, um, the picking process uh, transfers uh, the dirt across the, the pipeline. So make sure to flush and lubricate the valves uh, after pigging and before operating them. So before closing this section, we have a second poll um, that John, you can launch. Based on your experience, which is the most common causes uh, of valve failure, issues prior to deliveries, so wrong valve specification, uh, valve unfit for service or damage during transportation and handling, or uh, issues before starting up the, the pipeline, welding the valve or commissioning uh, the line, or in service, uh, problems with maintenance or damage uh, caused by throttling, valve over torquing, picking issues or coating problems. We'll leave you a uh, few seconds for uh, participating. Okay, this is very interesting. So 63% of the participants uh, experience problems with the valves in service. Um, of course, when the valve is in service is when you see uh, the problems, but the cause could be uh, in the previous areas. So the, according to your experience, uh, issues are related to uh, maintenance, uh, throttling, uh, over torquing, pigging, and failure on uh, coating. Thank you for participating in the poll. So this uh, is the end of uh, the second section of this webinar. And again, Jeff, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, we move on. Uh, no questions yet, Ben. You must be doing a great job. OK, thank you. So let's move to the uh, third section, what we see in the natural gas industry. And uh, of course, uh, as a valve company, we want to be ready for what happens next and developing new products requires some time. So we want to be ahead of, uh, of the game. And uh, these are the, the trends we see. This is, uh, uh, I would like to have an open discussion about uh, this because we are entering into the, the opinions uh, world. There is never a certainty about the future. But uh, of course, this format doesn't help much for having interactive uh, sessions. Uh, but if you want to follow up, let me know. With uh, the friends at CR World, we will be happy to have uh, uh, conference calls uh, or in-person meetings when and where possible. So this uh, chart on the left uh, shows how the US Energy Information Administration is uh, forecasting the future. Uh, as energy sources by uh, over time. So natural gas is already the uh, most used source and uh, through 2050, it is just supposed to grow. So um, this confirms that natural gas is the main source of, uh, of energy and it will be for the foreseeable future. And it is because it is uh, available affordable, safe, and clean. However, uh, clean is never clean enough. Uh, so we are looking, the industry in general is looking for ways to make uh, natural gas even more clean. And the two uh, most promising technologies are renewable natural gas. So uh, transforming methane emissions um, and using them converting them in uh, CO2 um, to make them uh, cleaner. And uh, of course, this technology is already implemented, but it's uh, continuously uh, being improved. The 
Hottest topic now is hydrogen and hydrogen blending into natural gas. Uh, the picture you see is uh, taken from uh, Enbridge uh, website. So uh, if we have participants to this uh, webinar from Enbridge, thank you for making this, uh, this available. Basically, um, the concept is to produce uh, hydrogen using power produced with other sources. And the ideal situation is where power um, is uh, creating through uh, renewable sources. And then uh, hydrogen can be used as a uh, storage uh, component. Uh, so offsetting the problem of renewable sources being uh, intermittent and not continuously available. And then hydrogen would be blended into natural gas and used uh, um, as it is now mainly for uh, power generation in uh, gas fueled power generation plants or for uh, uh, direct heating or combustion for, uh, for cooking. So let's uh, focus mainly on uh, hydrogen. So this chart uh, shows the number of uh, technical publications over time. And as you can see, um, the, this is a new uh, topic. Uh, before 2004, there were very, very few publications. And in the last few years, it is really booming. So there is a, it is hot, but there is still a lot to learn. In North America, US and Canada, there are a lot of initiatives by different um, gas companies, uh, including ATCO and Enbridge. And again, we may have attendees to the, this webinar from these two companies. And most of the projects are in uh, early stage or still uh, pilots. But uh, very quickly, uh, the plans are to ramp them up and make them commercially viable. So looking at, uh, at valves, uh, uh, there are some concerns. So the requirements are very unclear. The hydrogen industry is uh, still in, in uh, its infancy. So uh, while for oil and natural gas, we have all the standards, the specifications available and a lot of experience, uh, for hydrogen, it is very unclear. There are some uh, standards like uh, ASMEB, 3112, that is about hydrogen piping, but for valves, there is no specific information. Uh, there is no clear requirement about what we speak of when we talk about hydrogen. The hydrogen uh, uh, partial pressure can vary a lot depending on the, uh, on the assumptions by the, the engineers and the consequences on uh, on valves and piping materials in general uh, are very different. And then there is no clear test requirement and they are not in the market uh, available test equipment specifically designed for hydrogen. Uh, it's important to note that when we speak about uh, hydrogen blending, uh, there are a lot of different options. There, there are people who talk about 2%, 4%, 10%, 25%. And there are also projects for uh, utility applications with 100% hydrogen. And of course, uh, uh, the impact on valves, it is very different. Again, some other concerns, hydrogen is a dangerous uh, um, element. It is colorless, odorless, so it's not easy to identify and it is highly explosive. Uh, the molecule is very small, so it's very hard to contain, and uh, it is asphyxian, so it is very dangerous for people. It's because of all these reasons, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, valves for hydrogen uh, service, zero leakage is a must. And uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, impacts of hydrogen on uh, steel materials. Um, hydrogen embrittlement is the most uh, common uh, and also hydrogen blistering. 
So the selection of the steel has to be uh, made very carefully. Uh, austenitic stainless steels have uh, better uh, resistance against uh, uh, hydrogen effects, but of course there is also a cost factor to keep into consideration. And then uh, uh, local stresses increase the effect of uh, hydrogen problems and um, welds or bends uh, are areas that are more stressed. Luckily, there are also some good news when we move forward. So we started with the bad news, but there are also some good news. The consensus uh, is that the, there are impacts of hydrogen on the materials, but those impacts are generally insignificant when the concentration is up to 50%. And this is a statement that I took from uh, um, a report made by the National Renewable energy lab in the US. So it's a very reliable uh, uh, source and this makes everything promising. It seems that with 50% hydrogen, uh, you can use the standard piping materials and uh, even the legacy systems you already have in place um, for your service without any risk. The strong recommendation is to add uh, external monitoring on emissions to make sure that uh, uh, there is no um, external emissions. Our uh, broad point of view is that we have ex extensive experience manufacturing ball valves for any natural gas service. So not just uh, clean and dry uh, natural gas uh, for utilities, but also extra sour natural gas uh, that you find in upstream services and LNG. And also we have experience with the uh, pure hydrogen service, also uh, at high pressure and high temperature where uh, the effects of hydrogen are uh, amplified. We supplied valves for hydrocrackers and hydro treaters for refining service, uh, where you can reach up to uh, 1000 Celsius and 2500 uh, PSI. Of course, uh, those valves are very special valves and the cost of those valves is more than 10 times higher than our standard uh, ball valves, but we have the experience. So whenever the requirements uh, will be clear, we will have options for you. At the same time, we are working with the, the AGA and CGA and other industry stakeholders to study the subject. I'm personally part of the AGA uh, Piping Materials Committee, and uh, we are working on a white paper that we are planning to release uh, at the AGA event in October, where the AGA will provide its perspective on hydrogen blending, including the impact on piping materials. So um, we will be ready to supply the valves you need whenever you need them. Uh, for me, my experience is that manufacturing valves is based on uh, open communication with our customers. So we need to know what you need to make sure that we are supplying the right valve. So I encourage you to uh, share as much information as you have, um, but we will be ready. And I think this ends also our uh, third section. So we are ready for our last uh, uh, poll, which is uh, a question for you. When do you think that uh, the blending of hydrogen into natural gas will be uh, technologically viable and extensively implemented by utilities? The options are within two to three years, by 2030, after 2030, or never. Well, wow. thank you for your uh, feedbacks. Uh, the good news is that nobody thinks that the technology will never implement it on a, a larger scale, but we have different opinions and uh, the feedbacks are almost evenly spread within two to three years. 
for the most optimistic. Most of the people say by 2030, but also a large group says after 2030. I, I'm more for the by 2030 option. I think that in the next two to three years, we will see a lot of uh, pilot projects and a lot of work will be done to define the standards and the specifications. But the larger implementation, I think it, it will take longer. But again, this is just my um, personal opinion. And I'm sure that people in the audience know better than me. So uh, again, Jeff, if we have any questions, uh, this is the time for questions on section three or on any of the other sections. We okay. are approaching the end of the hour that we had scheduled for this uh, webinar. Um, so I have just few uh, conclusions after your questions. Uh, Jeff, any input? Still no questions then, you're all good. Okay. I hope you enjoyed uh, this, uh, this session and uh, there was something new for you to learn and uh, or at least this generated some more interest in uh, API 6D valves and in valves for natural gas. I have a few brief uh, conclusions. Uh, valves are critical pieces of equipment to ensure the performance and safety of pipeline systems. So it is important to pay attention to them. When you decide about valves and when you handle and use them, uh, be careful and be informed. Know what the relevant standards are, keep them handy, know your options, and uh, try to know as much as possible about your specific service requirements. Um, each company is different, each pipeline is different. Uh, sometimes you can use the same valve, sometimes you need uh, special valves. And uh, my recommendation is always to talk uh, with your suppliers, express uh, your questions, doubts, and opinions and then select the right valve partner with knowledge, experience, and the local presence. Um, ask for documentation, ask for clarifications, for drawings to make sure that you know what you will be using in your systems. And thank you very much for attending. Uh, again, here you have our general uh, contact information, uh, email and website, follow us on uh, LinkedIn uh, and keep your communication open with the CR wall. And again, we are open for any follow-ups. If you have questions, uh, if you want to have a dedicated uh, session for uh, yourself or your colleagues, let us know and we will make ourselves available. And then I'll hand over the stage to Jeff and the CR wall for their uh, closing uh, notes. Thank you, Ben, great job. And still no questions. So you must have answered everybody's questions. Um, I have one announcement um, coming up on May 13th. We're um, offering another complimentary uh, CR Wall Gas Academy session, and it's going to be with CR Wall. CR Wall is going to talk about um, different valve fittings, valve adapters, the proper injectables, grease, and sealants, and then the proper pumps. Uh, so please join us if you need any information on those. Reach out to me or anybody at CR Wall. We'll help you. And then once again, thanks everyone for joining us. Thank Be you. Safe. Bye. Bye-bye.